Good morning and hi guys, this is Connie. This is coming back from another, uh, future Connie has to edit this out because I had not read ahead in the chapter that is coming. And there are not only some uh, profane words, but also words that I don't feel are appropriate for me to personally use because I don't use them in my regular vocabulary. But they are part of the book and I don't believe in censoring the book. I try to read it as soon as I see it on the page. And I'm obviously very uncomfortable about it because I'm still learning how to be an anti-racist. And uh, one of those is how I use my vocabulary in everyday language. So know that that is, there are some words. There are some words. I am uncomfortable and you're gonna hear them right now. And these chapters just keep getting longer. Hi guys, this is Connie. Back for some more Connie Reads How to Be an Anti-Racist. We are on chapter six. This one is titled Body, and we have a couple new definitions. Bodily racist, one who is perceiving certain racialized bodies as more animal-like and violent than others. Bodily anti-racist, one who is humanizing, deracializing, and individualizing non-violent and violent behavior. Done finished wearing uniforms, through with attending chapel service, the older I became, the more I despised the conformity of private schooling and churching. After eighth grade, I was finally free of them. I enrolled in John Brown High School, a public school that my Haitian neighbor Gil attended. It was in Flushing, in central Queens, just across the street from Queens College. <clears throat> we bathed in the ambient noise of the nearby Long Island Expressway. In the mid-1950s, public housing authorities allowed my grandmother to move into the predominantly white uh, Pomano houses due south of John Brown. Dad went through all of his local elementary schooling in the late 1950s without noticing another black student, only the kids of working class white families who were even then fixing to flee the suburban Long Island, or fixing to flee to suburban Long Island. By 1996, they were nearly all gone. After school, John Brown students jammed into public buses like clothes jammed into a drawer. As my bus made its way towards uh, Southside Queens, it slowly emptied. On this day, I stood near the back door facing a teenage boy we called Smurf. A nickname he earned from his shirt, or from his short skinny frame, blue black skin, thick ears, and big round eyes that nearly met in the center of his face. As I stood near him, Smurf reached into his pants and pulled out a black pistol. He stared at it and I stared at it too. Everyone did. Smurf looked up and pointed the gun, loaded or unloaded, directly at me. You scared, yo? He asked with almost brotherly warmth, a smirk resting on his face. Blacks must understand and acknowledge the roots of white fear in America, President Bill Clinton said in a speech on October 16, 1995, the same day as the Million Man March. He'd escaped the march and the black men assembling practically on the White House lawn for the campus of the University of Texas. There was a legitimate fear of the violence that is too prevalent in our urban areas, he added. By experience, or at least what people see on the news at night, violence for those white people too often has a black face. History tells the same story. Violence for white people really has too often had a black face, and the consequences have landed on the black body across the span of American history. In 1631, Captain John Smith warned the first English colonizer of New colonizers of New England that the black body was, a devil was as devilish as any people in the world. Boston pastor Cotton Mather preached compliance to slavery in 1696. Do not make yourself infinitely blacker than you are already. <clears throat> oh my gosh. Virginia Lieutenant Governor Hugh Drysdale spoke of the, quote, cruel disposition of those creatures, unquote, who planned a freedom revolt in 1723. Succeeding, or seceding Texas legislators in 1861 complained of not receiving more federal, quote, appropriations for protecting against ruthless savages, unquote. U.S. Senator Benjamin Tillman told his colleagues in 1903, the poor African has become a fiend, a wild beast, sinking, a wild beast seeking whom he may devour. Two leading criminologists, uh, uh, who cited in 1967 that the, 
quote, large criminal display of the violence among minority groups such as Negroes, unquote, stems from their, quote, subculture of violence. Manhattan Institute fellow Heather McDonald wrote, the core criminal justice population is the black underclass in the war on cops in 2016. This is the living legacy of racist power, constructing the black race biologically and ethically and presenting the black body to the world's first and foremost as a beast. To use Gomez de Zazora's term, as violently dangerous as the dark embodiment of evil. Americans today see the black body as larger, more threatening, and potentially, or and more potentially, wait a minute, I'm not getting that sentence correct. Americans today see the black body as larger, more threatening, more powerfully harmful, and more likely to require force to control than a similarly sized white body, according to researchers. No wonder the black body had to be lynched by the thousands, deported by the tens of thousands, incarcerated by the millions, segregated by the tens of millions. When I first picked up a basketball at around eight years old, I also picked up on my parents' fears for my black body. My parents hated when I played ball at, a nearby, at nearby parks, worried I'd get shot. I tried to discourage, they and tried to discourage me by warning me of the dangers waiting for me out there. In their constant fear-mongering about black drug dealers, robbers, killers, they nurtured, me, they nurtured in me a fear of my own black neighbors. When I proposed laying concrete in our grassy backyard and putting up a basketball hoop there, my father built a court faster than a house flipper, a nicer one than the courts at nearby parks. But the new basketball court could not keep me away from my own dangerous black body or from Smurf on the bus. Nah, yo, I coolly responded to Smurf's question about my fear. My eyes locked on the gun. Whatever, man, he snickered. You scared, yo? Then he jammed the gun in my ribs and offered a hard smile. I looked at him straight in the eye, scared as hell. Nah, yo, I said, giggling a little. But that's a nice piece, though. It is, ain't it? <clears throat> Satisfied, Smurf turned gun in hand and looked for somebody else to scare. I exhaled relief, but I knew I could have been harmed that day, as I could have other days, especially, I thought, inside John Brown High School, surrounded by other black and Latinx and Asian teens. Moving through John Brown's hallways, eyes sharper than my pencils, I avoided stepping on new sneakers like they were landmines, though when I did accidentally step on one, nothing exploded. I avoided bumping into people, worried a bump could become a hole in my head, though when I did inevitably bump into someone, my head stayed intact. I avoided making eye contact as if my classmates were wolves, though when I did, my body did not get attacked. I avoided crews, fearing they would flock at me any moment, at any moment, though when I did have to pass through a crew, I didn't get jumped. What could happen? based on my deepest fears mattered more than what did happen to me. I believed violence was stalking me, but in truth, I was being stalked inside my own head by racist ideas. Crews ran in my high school, like crews run America, and I considered joining the Zulu Nation, awed by its history and reach. Witnessing an intimidation, oh, uh, witnessing an intimidation changed my mind. The perverse mix of punches and stomps, handshakes and hugs turned me off, but I did have an informal crew bound by an honored clad, ironclad loyalty that required us to fight for each other should the occasion arise. <clears throat> One day we met another crew on a block near the Long Island Expressway, maybe five of us and 15 of them, all staring menacing, menacingly at each other as we approached. <clears throat> this was new to me the showdown, the curses flying and landing, the escalating displays of anger, threats slamming like fists. I was in the mix with the rest of them, but passing drivers glancing over could not see that I was fighting my nervousness more than anything. One threat led to another. One rushed me, as small and unassuming as I was. I saw Big Gill fighting off punches. I wanted to help him, but then I saw a tall, skinny, solitary teen looking around nervously. He reminded me of myself. I crept up behind him 
and jump through a vicious right hook. He went down hard on the pavement. I skittered off. Soon we heard sirens and scattered like ants, fearful of getting smashed by the NYPD. We were unarmed, but we knew that blackness armed us even though we had no guns. Whiteness disarmed the cops, turned them into fearful potential victims. Even when they were approaching a group of clearly outstrapped and anxious high school kids. Black people comprise 13% of the US population, and yet in 2015, black bodies accounted for at least 26% of those killed by police, declining slightly to 24% in 2016, <clears throat> 22% in 2017, and 21% in 2018, according to the Washington Post. Unarmed black bodies, which apparently look armed to fearful officers, are about twice as likely to be killed as unarmed white bodies. Gil and I ran over the Long Island Expressway overpass and hopped onto a departing bus, feeling lucky, catching our breath. I could have gone to jail, or worse, that day. More than the times <clears throat> I risked jail, <clears throat> I am still haunted by the times it did not help the victims of violence. My refusal to help them jailed me in fear. I was scared of the black body as the white body was scared of me. I could not muster the strength to do right. Like that time on another packed bus after school, a small Indian teen, tinier than me, sat near me at the back of the bus that day. My seat faced the back door and the Indian teen sat in the single seat right next to the back door. I kept staring at him, trying to catch his eye so I could give him a nod that would direct him to the front of the bus. I saw other black and Indian kids on the bus trying to do the same with their eyes. We wanted so badly for him to move, but he was fixated on whatever he was playing on his fresh new Walkman. His eyes were closed and his head bobbed. <clears throat> Smurf and his boys were on the, the bus that day too. For the moment, they were blocked from the Indian team boy by the bodies of other kids. They couldn't see him sitting there. Uh, but when the bus cleared enough for them to have a clear lane to him, Smurf, as expected, focused in on the thing we didn't want him to see. He did not have a pistol that day, or maybe he did. Smurf motioned to his boys and stood up. He walked a few feet and stood over the Indian teen, his back to me, his head turned to face his boys. What the fuck? He pointed his finger like a gun at the seated teen's head. Look at this motherfucker. In 1993, a bipartisan group of white legislators introduced the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. They were thinking about Smurf and me. The Congressional Black Caucus was also thinking about Smurf and me. They asked for $2 billion more in the act uh, for drug treatment and $3 billion more for the violence prevention programs. When Republican called those items welfare for criminals, they demanded they be scaled back for their votes. Democratic leaders, they be scaled back for their vote, votes. Democratic leaders caved. 26 of the 38 voting members of the Congress of the Congressional Black Caucus caved too. After all, the bill reflected their fear for my black body and of it. The policy decision reflected their dueling consciousness and their practical desire to not lose the prevention funding entirely in a rewrite of the bill. On top of its new prisons, capital offenses, minimum sentences, federal three strike laws, police officers, and police weaponry, the law made me eligible when I turned 13 in 1995 to be tried as an adult. Never again would Washington put politics and party above law and order, President Bill Clinton said upon signing the bipartisan biracial bill on September 13th, 1994. I don't, <clears throat> this is in the, this is in the book and I don't believe in, uh, censoring myself, but, um, I don't, it just gets worse. This is not my book. Um, yo, nigga, run that Walkman, Smurf said rather gently. The kid did not look up, still captivated by the beat coming from his headphones. Smurf punch-tapped him on the shoulder. Yo, nigga, run that Walkman, he shouted. I wanted to stand up and yell, uh, leave that nigga alone. Why are you always fucking with people, Smurf? What the fuck is wrong with you? But my fear caged me. I remained seated and quiet. 
The kid finally looked up, startled. What? The shock of Smurf looming over him and the loudness of the music made him raise his voice. I shook my head, but without shaking my head, I remained still. Clinton Democrats thought they had won the political turf war to own crime as an issue, to the war on the black body for, for votes, but it took little time for racist Americans to complain that even the most expensive crime bill in human history was not enough to stop the beast, the devil, the gun, Smurf, me. Around Thanksgiving in 1995, <clears throat> Princeton political scientist John J. Uh, DiDulio Jr. warned of the, quote, coming of the super predators, unquote, especially young bodies like mine in black inner city neighborhoods. DiDulio later said he regretted using the term, but DiDulio, or Delili, Dilili, I'm totally butchering this guy's name. I can't, can't say that word. Um, Diulio? Diulio. I'm so stuck. But Diulio never had to internalize this racist idea and look at his own and look at his own body in fear. He never had to deal with being hunted. My friends at John Brown did. I did. In 1996, I turned 14. A super predator was growing in me. In Smurf, they said. I believed what I heard. <clears throat> Most inner city children grow up surrounded by teenagers and adults who are themselves deviant, delinquent, or criminal. Diulio wrote, watch out. A new generation of street criminals is upon us, the young, upon us, the youngest, biggest, and baddest generation any society has ever known, he warned. My band of juvenile super predators were radically impulsive, brutally remorseless youngsters, including ever more pre-teenage boys who murder, assault, rape, rob, burglarize, deal deadly drugs, join gun-toting gangs, and create serious communal disorders. We, the young black super predators, <clears throat> were apparently being raised with an unprecedented inclination towards violence in a nation that presumably did not raise white slaveholders lynchers, mass incarcerators, police officers, corporate officials, venture capitalists, financers, drunk drivers, and war hawks to be violent. That's horrible. That's messed up. That's more messed up than me trying to... Ugh, I don't I have to say it a few more times again. It's in the book. <clears throat> this swarm of super predators never materialized in the late 1990s. Violent crime had already begun its dramatic decline by the time I stared at Smurf demanding that Walkman in 1996. Homicides had dropped to their lowest levels since the Reagan era, when intense crack market competition and unregulated gun trafficking spiked the rate. But crime bills had never correlated to crime any more than fear has correlated to actual violence. We are not meant to fear suits with policies that kill. <clears throat> we are not meant to fear good white males with AR-15s. No, we are to fear the weary unarmed Latinx body from Latin America, the Arab body kneeling to Allah is to be feared. The black body from hell is to be feared. Adept politicians and crime entrepreneurs manufacture the fear and stand before voters to deliver them, messiahs who will, be li who will liberate them from fear of these other bodies. <clears throat> in the book. Oh, I don't want to read it anymore. Oh. <sighs> Nigga, you didn't hear me, Smurf fumed. I said, run that fucking Walkman. In my mind, I tried to devise a strategy for the poor kid, imagining myself in his place. I had... I had a bit of gift for staying calm and diffusing potentially volatile situations, which served me well, whether I was dealing with the violently finicky smurfs of the world or capriciously violent police officers. I learned to disarm or avoid the smurfs around town, kids bent on mayhem, but I also saw that strangers were doing the same calculations when they saw me coming. I'd see fear in their eyes. <clears throat> They'd see me and decide they were looking at smurf. We scared them uh, just the same. 
All they saw were our dangerous black bodies. Cops seemed especially fearful. Just as I learned to avoid the Smurfs of the world, I had learned to keep racist police officers from getting nervous. Black people are apparently responsible for calming the fears of violent cops in the way women are supposedly responsible for calming, calming the sexual desires of male rapists. If we don't, then we are blamed for our own assaults, our own deaths. But at that point, the kid across from me was out of options. There was probably no way to defuse the situation. Run that fucking Walkman, Smurf yelled, now turning heads at the front of the bus and most likely prompting the bus driver to call the, ruck the ruckus in. The shocked teen started to stand up, saying, saying nothing, just shaking his head. He probably intended to relocate to the front near the, relatively safe, near the relative safety of the bus driver. But as soon as he straightened his body, Smurf landed a side haymaker into the kid's temple. His head bounced into the window and then onto the bus floor. Smurf snatched the tumbling Walkman, then his boys got up to join in. The kid covered his face when, he, uh, when the stomps from Timberland, Timberland, boots, Timberland boots came pummeling down. It all happened right in front of me. I did nothing. I did nothing. The bus stopped, the back door opened, Smurf and his boys leapt off and ran away, lighthearted, grinning, but I noticed that four eyes from Smurf's crew remained on the bus, lurking and looking, seemingly waiting for somebody to help this kid laid out in agony. I did nothing. The responsibility of keeping myself safe followed me like the stray dogs in my neighborhood, barking fear into my consciousness. I never wanted to arrive home to my parents with empty pockets and no shoes, with a leaking, beaten body like the Indian kid. Or worse, no arrival at all, only a letter from the police reporting my murder, or a phone call from the hospital. I convinced my parents, or so I thought, I was safe. But I did not convince myself. The acts of violence I saw from Smurf and others combined with the racist ideas all around me to convince me that more violence lurked than there actually was. I believed that violence didn't define just Smurf, but all the black people around me, my school, my neighborhood. I believe it defined me, uh, that I should fear all darkness up to and including my own black body. Those of us black writers who grew up in inner city black neighborhoods too often recall the violence we experienced more than the nonviolence. We don't write about all those days we were not faced with guns in our ribs. We don't retell all those days we did not fight, the days we didn't watch someone get beaten in front of us. We become exactly like the nightly locomotive shows. If it bleeds, it leads. And our stories center on violent black bodies instead of the overwhelming majority, majority of nonviolent black bodies. In 1993, near the height of urban violent crime for every thousand urban re residents, 74 or 7.4% reported being victims of violent crime, <clears throat> a percentage that declined further thereafter. In 2016, for every thousand urban residents, about 30 or 3% reported being victims of violent crimes. These numbers are not precise. Researchers estimate that more than half of violent crimes from 2006 to 2010 went unreported to law enforcement. And even being around violent crime can create adverse effects. But the idea that directly experience, uh, experienced violence is endemic and everywhere, affecting everyone, or even most people. <clears throat> that black neighborhoods as a whole are more dangerous than war zones, to use President Trump's term, is not reality. It all makes sense that this is the story we so often tell. The fist swinging gunshots and early deaths cling to us like second skin, while the hugs and dances and good times fall away. But the writer's work reflects and the reader consumes those vivid, searing memories, not the everyday lived reality of the black body. As many moments uh, as I had of anxiety and fear from other black bodies, I probably lived many more moments in serenity and peace. As much as I feared that violence stalked me, my daily life was not organized around that fear. 
I played baseball for years with white kids on Long Island and always wondered why they never wanted to visit my neighborhood, my home. When I would ask, the looks of horror on their faces and even more on their parents' faces startled and confused me. I knew there were dangers on my block, but I also thought it was safe. I did not connect the whole or even the most of Southside Queens with violence, just as I did not connect all or even most of my black neighbors with violence. <clears throat> certain people like Smurf, certain blocks, certain neighborhoods I knew to avoid, but not because they were black. We were almost all black. I knew in a vague way that black neighborhoods with high rise public housing like 40P, the South Jamaica houses, or Baisley Park houses were known to be more violent than neighborhoods like mine, Queens Village, with more single family homes, but I never really thought about why. But I knew it wasn't blackness. Blackness was a constant. <clears throat> a study that used National Longitudinal Survey of Youth Data Form or Youth Data from 1976 to 1989 found that young black males engaged in more violent crime than young white males. But when the research compared uh, only employed young males to, of both, oh, but when the researchers compared only employed young males of both races, the differences in violent behavior vanished. Or as the Urban Institute stated in a more recent report on long-term unemployment, Communities with a higher share of long-term unemployed workers also tend to have higher rates of crime and violence. <clears throat> Another study found that the 2.5% decrease in unemployment between 1992 and 1997 resulted in a decrease of 4.3% for robberies, 2.5% for auto theft, 5% for burglary, and 3.7% for larceny. Sociologist Karen F. Parker strongly linked the growth of black-owned businesses to a reduction in black youth violence between 1990 and 2000. In recent years, the University of Chicago Crime Lab reported with the One Summer Chicago Plus Jobs Program, uh, or worked with the program Jobs, or the program. <clears throat> In recent years, the University of Chicago Crime Lab worked with the One Summer Chicago Plus Jobs Program and found a 43% reduction in violent crime arrests for black youths who worked eight week long, or who worked eight week long part-time summer jobs compared with a control group of teens who did not. In other words, researchers had found a much stronger and clearer correlation between violent crime levels and unemployment levels than between violent crime and race. Black neighborhoods do not all have similar levels of violent crime. If the cause of the violent crime is the black body, if black people are violent demons, then the violent crime levels would be relatively the same no matter where black people live. But black upper income and middle income neighborhoods tend to have less violent crime than black low income neighborhoods, as is the case in non-black communities. But that does not mean low-income black people are more violent than high-income black people. That means low-income neighborhoods struggle with unemployment and poverty and their typical byproduct, violent crime. For decades, there have been three main strategies in reducing violent crime in black neighborhoods. Segregationists who consider black neighborhoods to be war zones have called for tough policing and the, black incar er, and the mass incarceration of super predators. just by saying it. <clears throat> Assimilationists say these super predators need tough laws and tough love from mentors and fathers to civilize them back to nonviolence. Anti-racists say black people, like all people, need more higher paying jobs within their reach, especially black youngsters who have consistently had the highest rates of unemployment of any demographic group, topping 50% in the mid-1990s. There's no such thing as a dangerous racial group, but there are, of course, dangerous individuals like Smurf. There is the violence of racism manifest in policy and policing that fears the black body. 
and there is the non-violence of anti-racism racism that does not fear the black body, that fears, if anything, the violence of the racism that has been set on the black body. I might have to repeat that again. This video has gotten very loud. Along. <clears throat> I think that paragraph deserves to be reread again because there are things in this whole chapter I did not want to read out loud, but this deserves being read at least two or three times. There is no such thing as a dangerous racial group. That, but there are, of course, dangerous individuals like Smurf. There is the violence of racism manifest in policy and policing that fears the black body. And there is the nonviolence of anti-racism that does not fear the black body, that fears, if anything, the violence of the racism that has been set on the black body. Perceptions of danger and actual threats met me each day at John Brown in various forms. There was the dangerous disinterest of some teachers, or the school's dangerous overcrowding, 3,000 students packed into a school built for far fewer. The classes were so large, twice as large as in my private schools, that detached students might, like me were able to hold, um, <clears throat> that detached students like me were able to hold our own uh, back of the room classes before detached teachers. I do not remember a single teacher or class or lesson or assignment from ninth grade. I was checked out following the lead of most of the teachers, administrators, and politicians who were uh, ostent ostensibly in charge of my education. I attended John Brown like someone who clocked into his job with no intention of working. I only worked hard on my first love. And that's the end of chapter seven. <clears throat> I hope that people who are listening to these chapters understand how incredibly uncomfortable and inappropriate I feel like it is for me to use some of the vocabulary that's in this word, but in this book, but I also feel like it's important for me not to leave any part of it out because I feel like that just kind of robs from the experience of reading the book. So um, I'm gonna have to go back, future Connie's gonna have to chime in and uh, give a warning because I did not have any intention of saying these words, these, in my opinion, a lot of these are curse words, um, in various parts, the obvious parts that I don't use in my regular vocabulary because that's just wrong. <clears throat> but it is part of the reading and I don't want to leave any part out as best as I can so oh be careful with that and enjoy please and thank you and I will see you on Thursday for the next installment have a great one